All right, now what I want to do is look at some common distortions that we see in a typical diffraction spectrum. So if we look at X-ray peaks, X-ray diffraction peaks, and, and you kind of recognize this from the previous module, is that what we notice is that all X-ray peaks do have some width. So they have, so all X-ray peaks have a finite non-zero width or full width half max. Okay. So that's the case in all cases. So we don't just see this, right? This is if it was perfect, right? We would just have a, a line. Instead, we have some width. And so this, this type of uh, line broadening can happen from a number of factors. So the first one that we want to examine is what we call instrumental, instrumental broadening. So this is broadening from the instrument itself. So this affects all samples and all peaks. So this is something we can't get around, instrumental broadening. So things that this can be a result of is uh, if the uh, if the beam is not perfectly parallel, so no beam is going to be perfectly parallel. Um, also, uh, we can have some broadening because K alpha, as we saw in a previous section, is actually composed of two very similar wavelengths, right? We saw this in a previous um, lecture. So that can also cause some widening or broadening of the, the peaks. All right, so before we go on, uh, let's uh, look at a, one of the quiz questions. So what I want you to do is calculate the difference in peak position caused by k alpha 1 and k alpha 2, so those are the two similar wavelengths we're talking about, um, at 30 degrees and at 100 degrees. So see if you can um, calculate the difference in peak position, and I'll give you the wavelengths from the book, or you can find them in the book. So uh, 1 is 0 0.15406 nanometers, and then 2 is 0 0.15444. Yep. <laughs> Let me rewrite that. 15444 nanometers. So see if you can uh, determine the difference in peak position for that, and I'll come back and we'll work through this uh, quiz question with you. Okay, so let's see if we can go ahead and calculate the difference in peak position uh, due to k alpha 1, k alpha 2. So this will give us an idea of instrumentation broadening. So uh, we've got the two wavelengths given to us. So now the first step is if you recall Bragg's Law, and I've foregone the N, so just dealing with first order reflections, um, and I am looking at um, this equation. Um, so I know the wavelengths and um, the angles are given to me in the problem statement. So really what I want to do is solve for the D spacing, because I don't know the D spacing. So if I take the, uh, rearrange this expression and solve for D, I get that I need to take my wavelength over to sine theta. So if I do that for the first uh, wavelength and this is, um, we'll look at it for the first 
angle. So this is 30, but this is in terms of 2 theta. So this is actually going to be 15 degrees. So if I plug that in, I get that my D spacing should be 29, uh, 0.2976, and this is in nanometers. So my D spacing is this. And the reason I did that is because now I can rearrange this and solve back for the angle using the second wavelength, right? Because I basically want to look at this D spacing and see the difference in the two uh, things here. So if I solve for two theta, that means that I take two times the sine inverse of lambda over 2d. So just rearranging that expression and multiplying both sides by 2. And so I get, um, and now I'm using the second wavelength, so 1, 5, 4, 4, 4 nanometers. And then my d-spacing that I got up here And when I do that, I get that my angle to theta is 30.08 degrees. So now, if I look at my change between the two, so delta, the, dif the difference, this is going to be 0 0.08 degrees at the 30 degree peak. Right? So this has given us that we have uh, close to 0.1 degree difference at 30 degrees. So that gives us an idea of how wide that will make the peak. So I can go through the same calculation for the 100 degree peak. So if I calculate what the D spacing is for that peak, for using the first one, and if you want to use it with the second, that's fine as well. Um, this is just um, giving us a difference in the end. And using 50 degrees, because, uh, you know, again, uh, we're looking at 100, so that's 2 theta, so we want to make sure it's in terms of theta, so 50. And this will give us um, 0 0.1006 nanometers. And if I calculate the 2 theta value, if we use the second, the copper K alpha 2, then this would be um, 2 sine inverse of lambda over 2d, which is the second wavelength, 0.15444 nanometers over 2 times the d value. And that equals 100.34 degrees. So the delta for this value is actually 0.34. So the this is uh, roughly, or it's actually over four times larger than at 30 degrees. So the broadening can actually increase um, in this case if the, the if there's still uh, a given single peak there. So uh, this delta is actually larger for, for this peak. So that's just the result of the differences in wavelengths between copper K alpha 1 and 2. Remember, there can also be an issue with the uh, beam not being perfectly aligned. So this is all factors that go into instrumental broadening. So the second type of broadening that we can get is due to what we call the crystallite size. This is also called shear broadening. So this is the second type of sources of broadening. So you can have a baseline of instrumental broadening that will affect all peaks. And then you can also have broadening due to crystallite size. And so what this means is it's caused by small, very small crystals. So that can be grains or particles. 
And so the the result, of, uh, the, the reason that small crystals can do this is because the beam divergence and convergence. Um, oh, sorry, there is beam divergence and convergence from incomplete uh, constructive interference, like you would see in a much larger crystal. So, excuse me, it's best to show this um, on the slide. So I'm going to switch over and show you what I'm talking about when it comes to this um, incomplete constructive interference. Okay, so this is an illustration of why crystallite broadening occurs by crystallite size, uh, also known as shear broadening. So uh, this is uh, imagining we have a, a small crystal, and this is the Bragg geometry where we have uh, the first plane, second, third, uh, fourth going into the material. Um, so what happens is that um, we have a maximum at the angle theta b. So that's what we always expect. However, there are differences um, in intensity when we have slightly different than theta b or uh, so down to uh, theta 1 or up to theta 2. So this is due to that incomplete destructive interference. So normally, if we had uh, numerous planes in a very large crystal, we would have more complete destructive interference where the uh, subsequent um, planes would cause uh, the amplitude to decrease when they destructively interfere um, at those non theta b angles. However, in a very small crystal, there are less planes. And so there's less destructive interference. And so that means that the amplitude at slightly different angles is uh, higher. And so it's, it, it's still less than the max, but it's higher than sort of the background. And it's because of this incomplete destructive interference. And this kind of just is showing you uh, what's uh, how that is. But really, I just like to think about it in terms of you have less planes and therefore you don't have the, the same level of destructive interference that you would with a much larger crystal because there are less planes in a smaller crystal. So you might look at this broadening due to crystallite sizes as a negative, but there is actually a positive. So if we think about it, if we are running x-ray diffraction on uh, a sample and we know that it's, uh, sorry, uh, and we want, we see these uh, fairly broad peaks, we can actually use the peak broadening to measure or estimate the crystallite size. So the smaller and smaller the peak is, or sorry, the, the broader and broader the peak is. So let's say we have uh, two different peaks here. Let's say we have these two versions. The smaller and smaller uh, crystals result in much more broad because we have more and more incomplete destructive interference. So small crystals have the broadest peaks and larger, uh, larger crystals have narrower peaks. So we can actually use this to measure or estimate the crystallite size. And uh, there's more information about this if you're interested. We're not going to go into extreme detail here, but uh, in chapter five of Quality, if you're more interested on how uh, this crystallite size phenomenon occurs. Um, but the one thing I do want you to think about, and this is going to be on your quiz, so this is a quiz question, is uh, why do I keep saying crystallite size? So I've made a point to say crystallite size.
instead of just calling it particle size. So think about why I'm calling it crystallite size and not particle size and answer that on the quiz and then come back and we will chat about that. Okay, so the reason I keep calling it crystallite size instead of particle size is because crystals and particles aren't necessarily the same thing. And so to sort of illustrate that, let's look at two different scenarios. So let's say I have one large crystal. So what you see here. So it's a continuous crystal structure uh, that is one crystal. So this big square, right? It's all one crystal. So if I measured this, you know, if I measured the, the length from side to side, uh, you know, that would be one distance, right? Now, let's say I have another particle, but that particle is actually composed of a number of much smaller crystals. So something like this. So if you're looking at this under a light microscope, this might appear to be just one large particle of, you know, again, if you go from the diameter, the diameter is roughly the same as what's over here. But in actuality, instead of one crystal, there's many crystals here, right? This one, this one, this one, this one, all these different crystals. And they, you can see that some of them have different orientations than others. So this is, uh, they're both particles, but this particle is composed of one crystal and this particle is made of multiple crystals. So XRD doesn't care about particles, right? It's not looking at the sum of these 10, right? It's going to look at each individual particle as a separate crystal. So each one of these crystals is a crystal light. So that's the size that it's measuring. So if you looked at the broadening effect, so this is a fairly large particle uh, measured by, or sorry, this is a very large crystallite because again, from side to side here, so it wouldn't be very broad. Whereas this one, even though the overall particle is uh, the same size, the individual crystals are much smaller. And so the, they would be uh, much broader. So crystallite and particle size are different because a, a particle can be composed of multiple crystallites. So when you're dealing with X-ray diffraction, you don't measure particle size, you measure crystallite size. So that's kind of the important thing to keep in mind here. All right, so I mentioned that we can determine the crystallite size uh, using X-ray diffraction and using that broadening effect. And so the equation that we use to do that is called the Shearer equation. And that's why we call it Shearer broadening, if you remember from the naming. So this is the Shearer equation. And what that is, is uh, depending on the reference that you use, you might see different terminology or different symbols. Uh, but we are going to use T as the crystallite size. So T is the uh, lowercase t here is the crystallite size, and it's going to be equal to a constant, which is typically 0.9 times the wavelength over B, or the full width half max, times the cosine of theta B. So basically the, ang the, the Bragg diffraction angle, the cosine of that, um, and then B, as you may remember, is the full width half maximum. So basically from that width, we can get, um, so from the width of the peak, uh, B. And so it's important to remember that B, if you're looking back at the plot here, B was the, the width, the full width in, from FW, uh, it and in terms of two theta, so it's basically the direct measurement off the plot of how wide this is, whereas this is in terms of just theta. 
Okay, so this will give us uh, the crystallite size. And so the general, generally, there's a limit to this equation, uh, the, the relevance of this equation, and it's good for uh, particle sizes that are less than or equal to about 50 nanometers. So if it's above 50 nanometers, the shear equation uh, kind of breaks down. But below that, we can use it to estimate the crystallite size. But as you should know is that, you know, we're talking about the second way that our peaks can broaden. The other one was instrumentation. And so there's kind of overlapping effects here. And so let me switch over to the slides and I'll show you the implications there. Okay, so this plot shows us the line breadth or the full width half max um, as a function of a particle or crystallite uh, dimensions. So the lower we get, you see that the, uh, the width goes up. And then as we go lar larger and larger, the contribution from crystallite size goes down and down. But that's on a baseline, as you can see here, of instrumentation width. So again, like, it, like we mentioned in that section, it was about 0.1 to 0.3 uh, or a little bit more. Uh, that was the instrumentation uh, broadening. And so you have to also know what that instrumentation broadening is to be able to sort of subtract that out from the width caused by your crystallite size. So that's an important kind of uh, thing to account for is that there are multiple effects uh, that cause the broadening of a uh, diffraction peak.